Hi everyone, thanks for joining me. Uh, it's Martin Shkreli, it's September of 2016, and we're resuming our financial and investing lessons and classes. Thanks for joining me. Um, it's been a long break, sorry about that. I think I pretty comprehensively went over what it takes to look at equities correctly, or at least what I think is correctly. Um, we'll be going for about two hours here. Um, try a little bit of a different format. We're gonna talk about something totally different. I think we got pretty bogged down, not bogged down, it's not a bad thing, but uh, pretty in depth on stocks. And I think that some people wanna talk about other parts of the world, investing world, I should say, and I'm happy to do that. Um, where have I been for five months? Well, I actually started a new company. Um, I um, have been mastering uh, computer programming, uh, which is a childhood hobby of mine, and uh, I've reconnected with it and kind of fell in love with it again, so sorry about that. But I promise that I'll um, be a little bit more um, kind of uh, doing these, hopefully every Sunday, it's Labor Day today, but hopefully every Sunday around uh, the afternoon or evening is a good time for me. I'm also um, gonna wrap up the general chemistry. Again, I'm, I'm sorry that the real life has sort of, uh, real life has uh, gotten in my way. Anyway, so what I thought I'd do today is back up a little bit of what I've talked about with respect to um, um, long-term investments. Um, basically, my contention is the biggest fallacy and arguably the biggest lie that's told today is that stocks go up in, over the long run. And this is a great example of what's called uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. So it just means that um, post hoc is an important word or set of words in Latin. And it just means after the fact, post hoc. Uh, and so here post hoc is sort of a, a logical, uh, uh, I guess, uh, proposition. So ergo is what we're which means therefore in English, um, post hoc ergo propter hoc, which loosely translates into it happened before. So it'll happen again. And I think that's, uh, it's sort of uh, one of the major fallacies you see in everyday life, right? Like horoscopes or superstitions or whatever. You know, if it rained on Tuesday every Tuesday for a month, you might think that there's something special about Tuesdays, and then you get really disappointed when, for the next you know year, it didn't rain on Tuesday. And it's just this kind of human fallacy that we we kind of um, you know uh, tend to sort of fall in love with repetition, and we fall in love with regularity. And the reality is that um, these things don't happen. So in this case, the the post hoc is the performance of in stocks over the last, say, 50 years or whatever. And so, you know, it certainly happened before, and we'll, we'll go through that data, and exactly what happened is, is the question. And the, the supposition or proposition is that um, it'll happen again, whatever these, this happened. And we know in, in math that these things are not, generally not gonna be connected. You know, if you flip a coin, I don't know, this is heads, and this is tails, we know that the outcome or, of flip one, the outcome of flip one has no bearing on flip two. And in general, that we can think of, I think of, of economic systems this way. Now, there could be systematic factors um, that result in, in this, this relationship being less than random. And, and we can talk about that. Um, you know, why do US equities seem to outperform other countries? Well, is that a systematic reason? Is this just sort of, sort of happen to happen? Is there causality? Um, that's, that's sort of the key question. And, and a lot of this boils down to basic statistics. And I think you'd be surprised at how many people didn't, uh, didn't do any basic statistics in life. So I actually went back and I, did, I made this fancy spreadsheet, which you can actually um, get on uh, the, shared, the shared folder. If you don't want to do that, it's fine. You can just watch. There's no, no real sense in downloading it. But if you wanted to, I, can, uh, um, I gave you uh, an, uh, that opportunity. Um, and yeah, if you talk about anything other than the contents of this course during my chat, you will get banned. And I, I don't have much of a, much apologies for that. So anyway, so here I put the S&P 500 uh, index price for the last, um, just last about 50 years, 51 years. I didn't go back further. I could have 
but uh, I'm just here to prove one point. And here we have the one year rate of return, which is just literally the year of, you know, this year over last year. Then I did five years, which is, uh, this is the geometric rate of return. And then I did 10 years, and then I did 20 years. So without any adjustments, and I'll show you what adjustments I made on the side here, but without any adjustments, you can see that recently the, the rate of return has been somewhat subpar. It's been on average about 3% over the last, say, 10 years, 10, 12 years. Um, and if you just take the last literal 10 years, it's about 2%, which is not, um, not a fantastic um, rate of return. You don't invest uh, part ways with your money for 2% returns. I think that's, that's needless to say. And if you look at inflation side by side over the last 10 years, it's been 1.59%, while return on the S&P 500 has been uh, about 2.4%. So net of inflation, you're talking about uh, 80 basis points, which is a really interesting kind of um, figure. So what's even more interesting though is if you take the mean return, uh, whether it's a one-year return, a seven-year return, uh, I'm sorry, five-year return, 10-year return, or 20-year return, you get about an 8% average return, which is really good. Um, I've said before, the greatest investors in the world can return 10, maybe 15% a year. So if you can get 8% a year, that's a really phenomenal return. The problem is I think that that's a fallacy. And I think that we're told this for various reasons. The, the primary one is just lack of understanding and some sort of inborn optimism. Um, the source of this data is just Bloom, Bloomberg, but you can look up S&P 500 prices anywhere on the internet. Um, the PCE is sourced from Bloomberg as well. I do make some, uh, I make, I have some sources for the Nikkei and RTS, um, but in general, if you don't see anything sourced, it's coming from Bloomberg. So, and we'll talk about dividends as well, but um, so if you take the max, the min, and the standard deviation, you get a little bit more information over the 20 years, you get this really nice 8% with a standard deviation of, of just 3%. So it's a really lovely result, right? If, if a two sigma return, negative two sigma return is still positive, that's a nice place to be. But again, I'll, I'm gonna explain why there's, there's a fallacy going on here. So I did this column uh, and I adjusted for inflation. And when you adjust for inflation, the rates of return get approximately halved. So inflation eats up about half of that return. And what is inflation exactly? We're gonna actually talk about that a little bit, um, but uh, you can see that the supposed 8% return is actually more like a 4% return. And then I take into account taxes, which is something that almost nobody takes into account. So we can argue that the US is like this structurally gifted, systematically gifted country where our equities will always outperform, which I think is a ludicrous um, kind of um, proposition in the first place. But if you assume that and you take the capital gains uh, tax rate, so I'm taking um, the real tax rate, which is what I pay, long-term capital gains, so this is short-term capital gains, there's two different rates, and it's a 20% um, national or federal tax rate, and then it's something like um, an eight to 10% state taxes. So if you're the average investor in the United States, you're talking about a 29% um, capital gains tax. So a third, almost a third of, of your profits have to go back to the government. And I'm actually not adjusting this in ways that I should to penalize it further. I'm being, I'm being pretty nice um, because remember, you're, you're paying a third of your gains, but you're not getting anything back for your losses, which are a real possibility. So if you take that out, you're talking about, um, at least over the last 10 years, a negative real rate of return. And even over 20 years, only a 4% rate of return. And I'm, I think that that would drop to sort of two or three percent if you looked at some other sort of more fair numbers. So you're you're really sort of in a position where I don't think you should assume that stocks go up over the long run because first of all, it's sort of a, a pretty ridiculous hypothesis to begin with. Why should anything go up over the long run? Why should there be any free source of, of gains for you? I mean, it's a very it's a very naive um, perspective if you think about it. I mean, you have to be a little bit um, foolish to think that there's a big pot of money available for you um, that uh, is not available or is, is widely and infinitely available for everybody. Um, it just doesn't make any sense if you think about it. Um, furthermore, there's, there's a lot of sort of other things here that we're not talking about that are a drag on this real rate of return, but I think I've sufficiently proven that 
you're getting somewhere between a, um, a negative rate of return and a small, very small positive rate of return um, if you're talking about the S&P 500. But again, we're really still dealing with the fundamental problem here, which is this is the best that we've got. The very best that we've got is a 4% uh, return, but we still haven't dealt with the, the issue of selection bias. We're looking at U.S. public companies. Why are we looking at U.S. public companies? Why are we looking at Indian public companies or Chinese public companies or Russian or, or Japanese public companies? I'm going to do that in a second. But the whole point of selection bias is that we're looking at the very best um, and we're extrapolating backwards, um, which is a terrible, terrible mistake logically and statistically. Um, for instance, if, if we said that, if we looked at Michael Jordan's um, I don't know, uh, track record as a basketball player, and we, we assume that, that you can have that same track record as a basketball player, you really are, um, you know, you would never do that. You, you would understand that that's foolish. Well, if you do that for, for the Nikkei or for the Russian stock exchange, you really get into a huge problem. So let's look at that for the Nikkei. And I didn't adjust these for inflation. Um, and what's interesting about the, the Nikkei is you have these really long periods, um, for instance, the post-war periods. This goes back to 1949. So this is the rebuilding. This is the end of World War II. This is the rebuilding of Japan. And you can see it rebuilt pretty damn well. The index was 100, um, uh, benchmarked at 100 in 1949 when it was created. And if you invested in, in 2016, you're looking at a 17,000. So how many years is that? It's about... Um, Let's see, it's about uh, 68 years. So we use the Excel equals rate, 68, zero, uh, present value is negative 109, future value is 17,000. It's an 8% return over 68 years. And you'd think, wow, that's pretty amazing. Uh, but again, we have a lot of selection bias here. Um, is our hypothesis that we want to buy countries after they've been through World War II, uh, or Great World Wars? I mean, that is sort of the hypothesis here. This isn't a reasonable continuing hypothesis. And you can see that in the last, in the last uh, 22 years, the average rate of return for Japanese stocks has been negative over a 10-year period. Um, and and why, is, why, why is Japan any different from the U.S.? Well, it isn't. You know, we picked the U.S. because it's election bias. But if you pick any other country like uh, Japan or Russia, you'd find that these, these are really uh, problematic. Um, problematic things to deal with. I haven't even adjusted for inflation or taxes here. And you're really dealing with, with, with gigantic issues. Here you have a 20 year negative expected rate of return for Japanese stocks. I mean, that's, that's not including inflation. There is not much inflation in Japan, if any, it's sort of negative, but you still have to, to reconcile the fact that if you're an investor, you have opportunity cost. You, have, you should expect positive returns. So this is, you're taking the risk of equities, mind you, which is, is riskier than debt. You're supposed to get paid more and you're not making any money. So I think that um, this is all really interesting, but the, the big myth that you can just make money by putting some money into a box and expecting it to go up is really, really ridiculous. Um, I had a, a chat with, uh, or I looked at a chat that uh, Chad Ochocinco, the football player had, and he actually reminded me of, of my family who never invested in anything and um, actually did just fine doing that. Uh, by focusing on your savings and your earnings, you actually do much better often than, than by being distracted uh, trying to become an investor. So I think that um, you know, if you watch uh, the, the cynicism and skepticism of uh, a football player, um, you know, sort of um, um, carefully denying all the investment opportunities in the world, and my parents who are, who are immigrants, um, with no education, that, I think that's actually more wise than trying to believe this lie that, that stocks go over the long run. I, mean, I probably owe my parents an apology from a very long time ago when I insisted that they, they invest. So anyway, uh, what I wanted to do is talk a little bit more about some of these dynamics and, and kind of discuss um, um, macroeconomics in general and how hedge funds and things like that uh, operate them and, and operate funds in this area. And one of the things, so I, I, I in, in the Investing Basics PowerPoint, which is now a whopping 62 pages, I added um, some things in red. And uh, so anything I added is in red and I'll black that out. And then when I add again, I'll add it in red. So in, in any event, Bridgewater is, is a hedge fund that I think is, is of some interest. Uh, it's the world's largest hedge fund. Um, it's $150 billion in assets. Um, 
So if you think about them charging, say, 1% um, per um, year, that's a billion dollars a year that they make just for uh, operating their hedge fund. And if they charge 10 or 20% incentive fee, you can add that up. If they made, say, 10%, that's 15 billion. 20% of that is 3 billion. Um, and they've done that for many years. So in any event, that's why Ray Dalio, their, their principal uh, of the fund, the guy who started the fund in 1975, um, is one of the richest people in the world. But what's interesting about Bridgewater is they're very different from any other hedge fund. They don't trade stocks. Uh, they might trade a little bit just by sort of by accident, but in general, they're not trading stocks. And we'll talk about what it means to be a uh, macro hedge fund. But when I started in hedge funds, I would have found a, a fund like Bridgewater very confusing. Uh, I would have said, well, what, why, how can they not be trading stocks? What is there other than stocks? And I think that that's one of the things that we're going to focus on in this, um, in this uh, chat. So one of the things that makes Bridgewater a little bit different from everyone else is something uh, a lot of, about their operating philosophy. Whether or not this has actually impacted their investing results, I'm not so sure. I think a lot of people aren't so sure, but they definitely have an interesting operating philosophy, and they call it uh, radical transparency. And so basically, this concept of radical transparency is is one where. Um, at Bridgewater's offices, everything is taped. Uh, every everything is uh, uh, every discussion is is it, it is people call it a cult sometimes. Uh, everyone sort of um, they have this policy where you just sort of have to opine on things and be sort of uh, radically honest about whether you feel like uh, ideas are good or bad. So you can you can call you're expected to call your peers. You know I don't think for the sake of disparagement, but. For the sake of transparency, you're supposed to say things like, well, I think this is a terrible idea because you're failing to understand this This is your flaw in your hypothesis. And you're supposed to be willing to do that without any sort of fear of punishment or retribution for you know, being sort of emotionally um, um, hurtful sometimes with respect to these decisions. And the idea is that we should rise above our emotional tendencies to be hurt when someone calls your idea a bad idea and uh, focus on the result, which is more important um, than um, perhaps the, the emotional impact. So um, a, good, a good quote from Ray Dalio's so-called principles is, how big of an impediment is psychological pain to your progress? And if you stop and think about that psychological aspect of, of becoming a better investor, or maybe a better executive, or whatever it is you do, a better student even, or a better parent, um, Psychological pain is extremely uh, uh, damaging. A lot of people, uh, they made 45 billion, not 45 trillion. Uh, no one's made 45 trillion. Um, the uh, psychological pain is, is the biggest impediment, I think, to all of our own progress. And I'm glad that Dalio is more gifted with words than perhaps I am. But um, the idea that um, we, we are our own worst enemy is something I've said many times in this series and that we struggle to, to progress because of our own inborn and ingrained psychological problems, um, particularly the fear of, of psychological pain, the idea that you could be wrong, the idea that you could be very wrong, the idea that you could have been doing something for 15 years or 20 years and have been dead wrong about what you were doing. That's something that, that's um, really painful. And so um, you can see all of Ray Dalio's principles on actually his this website, principles.com, which is, uh, something I would encourage you to go and read. It's somewhat autobiographical, it's somewhat um, instructive, and I think you'll enjoy it very much. Um, and there's just a couple of quotes there, but you can kind of see um, some of them here. Let's go and visit this briefly, just to sort of check it out and uh, see what it's all about. So if you go to my most fundamental life principles, you can kind of see um, Things like, I worked for what I wanted, not for what others wanted me to do. Um, I wrestled with my realities, reflected on the consequences of my decisions, and learned and improved from this process. Some of it is, again, autobiographical. This sort of traces back his, his history uh, and life. Um, truth, more precisely an accurate understanding of reality, is the essential foundation for producing good outcomes. And again, this is sort of why I sat there and made this spreadsheet about... Um, uh, the markets, you know, there, there's this ostensible truth we're given by the world that stocks go up over the long run. And we've built all these massive structures like mutual funds and 401ks around this 
so-called truth, but the reality is it's not true, um, which is really uh, enormous. And even if it is true to a very small extent, like say the markets generate three or five percent returns, and if you want to twist the numbers and torture them to the way back in the beginning and the founding of this country, again, you're just torturing your, your, your bias even further to prove a point. But if you really wanted to believe that, um, at the end of the day, what I pointed out with respect to inflation and taxes truly undermine the argument by at least 50 to 75 percent. So in any event, um, you can see that uh, what Dalio is, is offering up here is that you can look at the superficial layer of the truths that were given, but I think that the real good results come from challenging, really trying to challenge um, uh, these foundations. And I think that for my own, just sort of grounded home, my own sort of experience in hedge funds was it was sort of um, difficult for me to succeed in hedge funds, and I think difficult for most hedge funds. That's why most hedge funds don't last very long. In fact, out of most hedge funds uh, that have ever been started, almost all of them have been closed due to lack of performance. And the very few that have performed, well, some of them have done it by doing illegal things. Some of them have done it by exploiting things that have disappeared. Some of them shouldn't be in business. Uh, some of them have negative results, even though they manage billions of dollars. So I think that the reality is that my own um, sort of coming to terms with the fact that the financial marketplace isn't a great place to make a lot of money. It is certainly not edifying psychologically to trade pieces of paper. Um, index uh, funds, I don't think outperform anything. Uh, maybe they outperform hedge funds, but they certainly in and of themselves are not, um, I think, a good returning instrument. So anyway, this sort of examination that Ray Dalio encourages, is this fundamental examination of the truth is, um, or this accurate understanding of reality, certainly led me to stop investing in, in managers of assets, in other words, uh, drug assets, like having a healthcare hedge fund. It, it made more sense for me to actually manage those assets directly. And that was a, a better way to sort of procure return or alpha or whatever you want to call it than anything else. And so he's got a lot of cool kind of thoughts here, and this has got to be hundreds of pages. Um, and you can see that there are these kind of uh, management principles. Do not feel bad about your weaknesses or those of others. So he's like, this is a very Darwinian and cutthroat approach. And I think, like I've said, I can teach you about how to um, forecast cash flows and, and do that really carefully, but it's all meaningless unless you pair it with this sort of psychological um, perspective and rubric that allows you to be sort of um, efficient and capable of discharging some of those things that I've taught in the last lessons. Do not feel bad about your mistakes or those of others. Love them. Create a culture in which is it, okay, it is okay to make mistakes, but unacceptable not to identify, analyze, and learn from them. A lot of these uh, are important. Don't, don't tolerate dishonesty. Intellectual dishonesty is, is the most important kind of dishonesty. Plain old dishonesty um, is obviously intolerable, but intellectual dishonesty is the one that we're, we're mostly focused on. Logical, unemotional discussions. Record almost all meetings and share them with the relevant people. This is, uh, this is maybe the most um, difficult uh, of all, uh, this idea that they, they record these meetings and make you watch them over again. I think there's a lot of people that um, uh, have trouble with this. Um, one, there's some practicality um, aspect to it, but the second is I actually think that the time drain from doing that is, is less productive than, uh, than um, uh, than actually doing it, but that's just my two cents. Um, so anyway, um, I'll, uh, I'll let you read this uh, at your own leisure, but I do think uh, here's the Jesus one, teach your people to fish rather than give them fish. Uh, of course, uh, we've read that uh, before. So anyway, that's, that's a little bit about Ray Dalio. Again, the most successful uh, by dollars hedge fund on the planet in history, Ray, or Ray Dalio's hedge fund Bridgewater has made more money actual dollars, $45 billion for its investors, that's more than any hedge fund in history. I think Bill Ackman's hedge fund has actually lost money for his investors since inception. And part of this is due to the, the growth of assets under management. With assets under management growing, um, uh, you end up, uh, these returns are, are important. For instance, I guess I can show you what I mean here. What often happens in hedge funds, and this has happened, I think, to a lot of funds, maybe Greenlight Capital would be an example, is that your returns look a little, let me get a thicker brush here. 
I like it thick. Um, so this is your, let's say this is your assets under management. And it sort of goes like uh, this, or I don't know, let me make it a little more logarithmic. Now let's say this is something like 10 billion, and this is, I don't know, this is sort of like 100 million, maybe 1 billion here. So this is the rate for the bulk of this fund's existence, the it's been a sub $1 billion fund, and then it kind of becomes this really big hedge fund because of various herd mentalities. Let me just take my uh, time to block some people here. All right. So, um, so let's say this is return, annual return, and let's say this is, say, 30%, some good, really good return. This is 10%, this is 0%. This is actually negative, a negative return. What often happens here is you'll have this, like, really good return until the, the fund hits this critical AUM. So even a couple of years in this territory, say down 10%, would produce an actual down $1 billion for investor years. While these 30% years uh, in the 100 to $1 billion range, that's only say $300 million. So it can, one, one bad year at 10 billion can wipe out your entire uh, track record of returns see how that works and they say two bad years and you really have done your investors a huge disservice and a lot of hedge funds have sort of that sort of happened um, to them but uh, Bridgewater has, has thankfully uh, um, evaded that so so what is a macro style hedge fund we're gonna talk all about what do they do if they're not trading stocks what the heck are they trading um, and one of the things that um, they go through is something called risk parity um, and this is sort of a strategy that they I wouldn't say pioneered but they definitely um, they definitely uh, pioneered it in some ways. Uh, they didn't invent it, but they, I think they put it to practice more than others. So um, this is a paper written not by Bridgewater actually, but by uh, AQR. AQR is a quantitative hedge fund. It's a little bit different from Bridgewater, but they do have some similarities. And this is a 12 page paper that I suggest you print out and read. Um, it's 11 pages if you exclude that, and maybe 10 pages if, or nine pages if you exclude, maybe even eight pages uh, if you exclude all the disclaimers and whatnot. But you can see that uh, um, there is a uh, discussion about risk parity. It's basically an asset allocation concept. One of the concepts of risk parity, as you can see, is, is sort of embodied in this concept here, which is just basically at what point do we have our portfolio, here's expected return and risk, at what point do we have our portfolio 100% in in these really safe securities, here's the safest security of all, treasury uh, um, uh, inflation protected securities. So TIPS are, are bonds issued by a sovereign entity, in this case the Treasury Department, our, our US, United States government, the least risky security because what they are is they're bonds without the inflation return. So you're really talking about yields that are a, a very, 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 very small, um, sub 1% usually. And then you've got uh, normal bonds, and these can be any kinds of bonds, right? They don't have to be treasuries, they could be corporate bonds. And here is a mixed portfolio where you have 60% stocks, 40% bonds, and here's like a really risky portfolio of 100% stocks, and he's even riskier, 100% emerging markets equity. So the question is, what kind of return do we expect? So one of the ways that people um, employ uh, risk parity, which I, I don't, um, I really don't um, uh, endorse, but it's, it's sort of something that's worked, it's this, it's this rebalancing concept. Um, so let's say, um, let's say you open your fund up and, and it's year one and assume all else is equal and, and equities have recently dropped 10%. We're gonna we're sort of just do equity performance, bond performance, and then we're gonna do um, uh, equity exposure and bond exposure. So obviously in year zero, your hedge fund wasn't around. And let's say the ideal mix is gonna be 60, 40. But you can see the equities dropped. So you might think, and I, I think this is a, a fallacy, but you might expect that equity performance is likely to, to go up. So you, instead of the 60, 40, In year one, you might actually have a 70-30 allocation because you've gotten the juice out of the bonds, so you might expect um, a 70-30% risk weighting. So I don't know, they'd say next year equities drop again. It's a big recession. Now, let's say bonds, I don't know, drop 5%. And 
And so you didn't do too great, by the way, because you lost 7% on the equities, and I don't know, you lost 1.5% uh, on the bonds. So in this year, you, you're down 8.5%, uh, but maybe your average, maybe you beat your average fund. Your average fund might have been down 9% or 8%, I don't know. So let's say in the next year, um, you know, you, you're, you become even more, um, you know, you, you expect equities will do even better. And lo and behold, there's a big rebound in, in the markets. Uh, equities go up, say bonds go down another 5%, and you have this great year where you return, I don't know, 16%. And so this is the idea. Then, then you might say, okay, you know what? I've had a lot of equities. I've been overexposed versus my 60-40, so I'm gonna go down to a 50%, 50%. And your hope is that obviously you're, you're sort of trading off the expected return with risk. And that's sort of the basic idea of, of risk parity. And this is one uh, way that people implement it. And you can see here uh, and in this paper by AQR kind of how, how people do that. And the actual implementation of risk parity is different from maybe what I just described and, and how others do it. But that's one uh, way to think about it. So let's turn our attention to sort of uh, macroeconomics. And I don't personally think that macroeconomics is investing. I think it's um, speculation. Uh, and how you define speculation and investing are, are two very different things. But one way to think about it that I kind of, I'm doing this a little bit on the fly, but one way to think about it. Um, yeah, it, it would be something like that. I didn't calculate it exactly right. Um, Vasilios, but yeah, yeah, something like that. So, um, you know, the idea of risk parity is that you rebalance as, as the returns are, are coming in and you assume that returns are linked to risk, but I don't, I don't think they necessarily are. Um, but in any way, uh, my point here is to introduce you to these concepts, not to, to do a long-winded sort of uh, analysis of them. So anyway, let's go, back, let's go ahead in uh, the discussion to kind of what is speculation and what is investing? And, and a lot of this is the semantics, expectation, investing. Um, but what I would say, um, sp speculation, you can define it as the, uh, uh, let's see, the, uh, the attempt to profit on a security uh, let's say on the price change of a security or of an instrument, let's just be very vague here, of an instrument which has no discernible discern discernible fair value. So in other words, you cannot determine the fair value of some security. And a lot of the securities we're going to be talking about today, you actually cannot, in my opinion at least, really determine their actual um, fair value. Uh, let me just... I love, for some reason, I, I, I find it therapeutic to actually sit here and erase it like this as opposed to the feels so real. Uh, I'm kidding, of course. Um, so, so things like the euro, dollar, the euro-US dollar pair, or the USD-EUR pair, there's no actual discernible fair value. You can't sit there and calculate, do a lot of calculations and a lot of diligence and say, I think this should be 130. It's more of a gut feel, and it's sort of like you're, you're relying on different principles that um, are really speculative. My opinion, um, you know, there's certainly, and we'll talk about what those principles are, but I don't think they're discernible. Thanks for correcting the spelling. I'm not the best writer in the world. Um, so, in any event, that's sort of what I think speculation is. Whereas, what I think investing is is the attempt. Notice the word attempt to profit on price change of an instrument which has a reasonably uh, 
reasonably, I don't know, falsifiable, discernible, falsifiable and discernible fair value. Now you can sort of falsifiable meaning you can scientifically determine its fair value without using sort of the voodoo, which I think is a little bit more voodoo, voodoo, I don't know, voodoo methods of, of sort of guesswork that you, you see in, in macro speculation, which again, I'm not here to insult them or um, uh, kind of uh, debase them or whatever. I think that it's just your taste. I like to, the sort of scientific method uh, of value investing. Some people like the speculative kind of um, psychological perception, and we'll talk about that in a minute. These are kind of what way in on this, whereas this is sort of calcul calculating, diligencing. It's all up to you. And you can, you can argue that these two are a branch of the general concept of arbitrage. The idea is that you can determine the future price of something while the markets can't. Whether you're going to do that through investing or speculation, that's the idea. And we've spent a lot of time on how to do that in investing. Um, how to calculate something and say, you know, I, I think that's a good investment because I think I'm going to get paid higher than my discount rate, etc. Whereas in speculation, you're sort of doing the same, but it's through a little bit of a different methodology. But either way, you're trying to make money, which is sort of what arbitrage is. You think that, say, euro dollars at dollar ten and should be dollar thirty, and you're going to make that twenty percent by speculating. Uh, whereas investing is sort of the same. You see a common stock. For $10, you think it's worth $50, you're going to arbitrage by making an investment that's calculating and diligent. So that's sort of uh, um, you know, one way to, to do it. All right, so what kind of um, things that we have to look at in macro? Maybe we should start by discussing the, the actual instruments that you can, you can trade, uh, and then we'll work our way backwards and, and talk about um, what it is that you're going to look at when you're trading those things. So in general, when people talk about macro, they spend a lot of time talking about currency, or sometimes we call it FX, foreign exchange. That is a big sort of, um, uh, there'll be time to interact with me later. If you want to call me an idiot, you can actually call me and I'll, we'll do a QA and a in uh, probably about 30 minutes. Um, so you're more than welcome to articulate your, your brilliant uh, hypothesis later. So currency and foreign exchange is, is a very sort of simple um, per, sort of simple thing. You know, people speculate on um, the uh, uh, value of currencies. Here's the, the British pound. You can see this dramatic, um, dramatic drop after uh, Brexit. Uh, the pound is uh, conventionally quoted in the number of uh, pound. Uh, let's see, actually, let's see, it's actually here, it's the price of one pound in dollars. So you can see that it takes, uh, it took a dollar fifty to uh, 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 to buy uh, one pound, and that dropped dramatically. In other words, the dollar strengthened to the point where it's now a dollar thirty-three. And you can see that the the currency hasn't recovered from Brexit. It was a huge drop. If you look at the historical return histogram. Um, one sigma is one percent. So the idea that this currency dropped um, quite a bit more, about 10%. That was a 10 sigma event, a 10 sigma event, which is really telling. A uh, 10 sigma event should never happen. <laughs> if you know anything about statistics, a 10 sigma event should actually never, ever happen, right? But uh, it wasn't temporary. You can see the pound drop was uh, permanent. <laughs> I don't know about, I don't know what's a, what looks temporary. Temporary would be what happened to the Swiss franc. The Swiss franc had, had a, a huge temporary drop here uh, or, or move here on the, the Swiss bank saying they won't peg and it actually went right back so a lot of people went out of business on the Swiss franc um, uh, situation. So currencies are basic pairs, currency pairs, where you have uh, one currency against the value of another currency. And you can do this in baskets as well. You can say, well, I'm going to bet the US dollar will appreciate or depreciate against a basket currencies, you call up your broker and say, I'm going to look at emerging market currencies like the Thai bot or, I don't know, uh, several currencies like that. You could pick any any currency. There's some currencies uh, that uh, are barely tradable. I, earlier, 
well, last year I was trying to put on a big uh, trade for the Kazakhstan currency, which is uh, uh, which is uh, called the the, the uh, let's get it. let's just get it out here. I don't want to mess it up. Kazakhstan. Even spelling it right. Because I think I'm spelling it right. I have not thought about Kazakhstan in a long time. Kazakhstan, there we go. The Tenge. I thought it was going to be the Tonge. Tenge, and this uh, this is a currency we, we that doesn't trade easily, but we were we were trying to capture this move. Uh, basically, this is a weakening. Ka Kazakhstan's a huge country. You can see the price of one dollar in Kazakhstan. So in the Kazakhstan Tenge, we expected this to blow out, but there's no way to actually trade this. So we were we were hoping that we could. This is why one of my traders named Lewis, uh, I wouldn't call him a trader, but one of my, my uh, employees called Lewis, and I encouraged him to spend some time, 90% of his time focused on, on uh, pharmaceuticals, but 5 or 10% of his time he could spend looking at anything. And we looked at the Kazakhstan stock markets and currencies, and this was a lot of fun. What happened is there was this huge, um, basically the entire country is, is focused on, on uh, oil. And what we were trying to do is, is figure out um, how to exploit that. You know, oil is, if you looked at oil, oil prices have been dropping for many, many years because it's super impulsible. And this, this country has its entire economy based on, on this commodity. And eventually, uh, this peg would would get uh, blown apart and you could actually double your money unlevered, right? So you can make 10, 20, 50, 100 times your money on this trade. And that sure beats trying to figure out if Pfizer is worth $20 or $30, uh, making 100 times your money. But the problem is this this volatility, I don't know that you could have gotten this leverage. Now, pre this trade, you could see it wasn't very volatile. But with each peg move, you could see that maybe it was a little volatile. But here, you can see that with this scope, you could sort of see so I'm not doing this very well, but you could sort of see that um, it's a little fritzy here. You can see that the axes were were just very very unimportant. But then you could see that if you change the axes, these these moves are you just change the date scope. These moves are enormous. Uh, this will probably blow out to 500 bucks, but there's no real good way to trade it. So we actually thought about ways to trade it on the black market or some other crazy. Way actually start an import export company and and hold some kind of carry trade. So there's a lot of ways to exploit these things, but I think it's it's more interesting to spend time doing that than actually um, trying to figure out the price of some common stocks that are widely traded, like an Apple or, or something like that. So um, anyway, uh, currencies are a huge part of of the macro investors or speculators um, kind of toolkit. Um, I don't trade currencies myself, but I'm always looking to learn new things. And we didn't think we could exploit, say, the euro or yen market, but the Kazakhstan market was something that we could find in arbitration. So what else do, do these traders trade? And why? how do we predict currency movements? We'll talk about that in a minute. It's not just um, uh, things like that. Um, this is a really weird currency. This is not a currency anyone trades. <laughs> um, so. Uh, how do we look at currencies that people actually trade? We'll, we'll do that in a minute. Um, I'll give you a hint. Uh, currency uh, and inflation have a t t tend to have a direct relationship due to what we call the carry trade. So the carry trade is this idea that if you have deposits in a country, let's say you have deposits in a high inflation country like Brazil. Well, the thing about having those deposits is they're going to be in the safest um, in the safest uh, places. So uh, let's say like Brazilian government bonds. Uh, if you have money in a Brazilian bank, um, they're not going to be in a bank like uh, uh, JP Morgan. They're going to be in a Brazilian bank in Brazilian bonds. And here the, you can see that these Brazilian bonds are yielding 2.7%, uh, which is a, a very healthy, uh, healthy yield. Um, 
a similar bond in the United States yields quite a bit less. And if you went to some other area, let's say like Russia, um, some Russian bonds, you're talking about really big yields. I don't know, let's pick a, let's pick some uh, interesting maturity. Say 2022. 20, this is just a, just a, not too too far away. So three percent uh, comparatively uh, against a treasury bond is is quite a bit higher yield. If we look at uh, let's see what is that six years from now, right? So we pick a treasury that's six years from now. You're talking about a one percent versus a three percent in Russia. So rubles are a carry trade. If you have rubles, you're you might get the benefit of that inflation. And what's interesting, if, if we pick a time where the U.S. had high inflation, and it did, and we pick a currency that existed, the euro, euro did not exist when this happened. But if we go back to the 70s, not 2070, Bloomberg, but 1970, um, you can actually see this is the exchange rate of the dollar and the pound. You can see this weakening and this tremendous strengthening, unheard of uh, in decades, where the United States, and let's go pick... Go pick um, government bond and go back to the 70s. And we can see that this carry trade dominated, that you had this really high inflation, 10, 12% inflation in the United States. And you also had this huge weakening or strengthening of the US dollar and a weakening of a very comparable currency, the British pound. And the reason, again, is if you had deposits in a U.S. financial institution, just having that deposit would earn you 15%. So you'd really, sh you'll run to the U.S. dollar. Now, comparatively, um, you'd also have this tremendous inflation. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic, and you can see that uh, um, uh, treasuries have, have gone up. The yield has gone down um, in treasuries. So what else do... Um, people trade. Well, futures are, are very common. And you, you might say, if you're trading equity futures, are you trading equities? Well, kind of. Um, so the equity um, equity futures are, are in the United States are called E-minis. And uh, the E-minis are, are a future that uh, you can, uh, this is a, not the right one, S&P E-mini, here we go, ESA. And these are futures contracts that that expire every month or so. And uh, you can see the volume and the interest. I don't know if this is the September E-mini or what, but these are futures contracts that you trade and they're actually more liquid, um, believe it or not, than uh, um, equities and E-minis are different. E-minis are futures, they're futures contracts. You can see here that they're, uh, uh, they're actual contracts that you have to deliver $110,000 um, and you can see the conversion ratios and things like that. Uh, margin requirements are very low for E-minis. Contract price is $50 per point in the index. Um, so this is something that a macro fund would trade, whereas an equities fund might trade the S&P uh, ETF, which is the SPY. You need a special license to trade futures. Um, and, and this is exactly right. I don't do macroeconomics. Uh, I trade, um, I trade, uh, I don't even trade. I invest in private equity, I build companies, I'm an entrepreneur, but I do know a little bit about this field and I'm happy to explain it to you. So futures uh, are, are uh, one trade that you could put on, for instance, is you can trade the Japanese futures, the Nikkei futures. And here's, uh, here's a Nikkei futures. Um, and what you might wanna do is you go long the future and you can short the currency. And this could be a hedge, or this could be a so-called Texas hedge, where you expect to make money on both. Um, and so you can do all kinds of exotic relationships based on your economic ideas. For instance, you might say, well, what will happen is the Japanese government will ease. Let me draw some of this out. And this is the example of a macro trade. You would say, short JPY and go long Nikkei. And why would you do this? Well, you might say, I think the government, the Japanese government, will ease more than expected. 
which will hurt the Japanese yen because of obvious you know, carry trade type implications. So I want to short the yen over, say, the euro or the US dollar. And we'll go long the Nikkei because I think this will stimulate Japanese economic activity. Com com companies that form the Nikkei index, like Toyota or Sony, etc., will benefit from that weaker, from that easing of monetary policy. So this is a trade where you're hoping to make money on both um, currencies and their stock prices are not necessary and and sovereign indices are not necessarily correlated. But this is the kind of this sort of um, hypothesis that you do based on economic research. Say you say, say you think that economic activity is bad and therefore the government wants to ease instead of tighten. Um, this is the only way to manifest this kind of trade. You can't do it in stocks. You can buy individual stocks, I suppose. But what are you going to do with respect to the, 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 this, this trade? And these get even more complicated, and we'll see how and why. But that's sort of an example of some currency trades and some futures trades. Now, there are more than just equity futures. There are things like commodity futures. Commodities, things like oil and, and, um, oil and gold. And you might say, well, Here's a, an example of a pair trade, and let me make it a little bit more hedged. So let's say I would uh, want to have more of a hedged pair trade. I want to go long commodities, and I want to be especially in commodities that have gotten beaten up, like crude. I don't know about gold, but maybe I want to be long crude, and maybe some other ones, small basket of, say, gold and silver and some ag commodities. And I want to also be long equities. And this is interesting. This is sort of a hedged trade. And we can get even more complicated in saying what kind of equities and why and, and, uh, and term structure and derivatives and, and all this stuff. But in general, why is this a hedged trade? Well, in general, these two are going to go in opposites. Things like gold and oil appreciate when equities go down. So this is a hedge that um, could make sense. You could make money on both sides, but in general, you're probably expecting to lose money. If equities keep going up, commodities will probably go down and continue to go down. But you might think that oil's had enough, and you think that uh, um, you, you, know, you could do well on both sides of that trade. There's all kinds of other futures. Could anyone name some more, some more futures? Some more types of futures that we haven't talked about? There's commodity. What else is there? While you guys try to figure that out, we're going to talk about some of the some other markets. Like one we totally haven't talked about is fixed income or credit markets. Well, that's a, orange juice is a commodity. Sports betting are not futures. Wheat, metals, those are all commodities. Precious metals are commodities. Yep, there's zero dollar futures. Glad you mentioned that. I put them up here. Interest rate futures, yeah. There's other kinds of futures. And futures just literally energy is commodity. But there's there's non-commodity energy futures, believe it or not. Um, tobaccos are, are uh, commodity futures. Gold isn't a currency, it's a commodity. Yeah, debt futures and things like that. So uh, I don't want to get too into commodities. I, I uh, you know, there's all kinds of commodities, but uh, this, you know, is a little bit beyond the scope of, of one, my expertise, and two, my interest. Um, uh, but let's keep going with the rest of macro. Um, suffice it to say, you can speculate on commodities and how and why you do that. I mean, sometimes um, you know, there are alternatives to fiat, like gold is an alternative to fiat. Um, and you can see, I don't know, I guess we can probably do some correlation coefficient um, with, let's say, gold. I don't know, let's, let's go back. 1950 if we can I don't know try that and we're here. we'll put gold in here and we'll put um, SPY or SPS index and let's see if they're correlated and how all right so we can see that they're slightly negatively correlated which makes sense gold drops when 
things are good and they gold rises when uh, things are um, uh, not so good and we can we can edit this matrix and put bonds and all kinds of things in here but uh, in general that's sort of the way some of those commodities work when they're alternative to fiat currency uh, gold people rush to gold for safety but then there's actual utilities like um, crude oil is, is something that sort of is more actually the opposite it's more correlated with economic activity this is uh, is this crude? This isn't crude, I don't think. Let's see, crude. Here we go. Oops, the wrong one. So it's forty-five dollars a barrel, and and there's some. It's not just about um, economic activity, but it is specific to the currency, like production levels and things like that. Right now, we're in a big crude bear market, but um, countries like China are going to be consuming even more crude, or will they? We don't know. China could be in a recession. They, they're not very transparent about where exactly they're at. Um, and things like wheat and corn are, are a lot less liquid markets that are really complex. And you can see the, the huge drops in commodity prices for, for agricultural commodities, um, like wheat and coffee and corn. And you can sort of think those through if you'd like, but uh, you know, they're, they're sort of, uh, there's weather futures, there we go. Thanks for, for adding that one. There's, weather, futures, and catastrophic bonds, all kinds of interesting different things to trade. But let's let's move on from futures and currency to some really interesting um, things, which is basically the entire sort of credit and debt markets. And those are um, really complicated. But you can go to something as simple as a trade like, this is maybe the most popular trade in the world, and it's a bigger market than the stock market, which is the US Treasury market. People trade the U.S. Treasury market every day. It's a much bigger market than the U.S. market, the U.S. equity markets in terms of trading activity. Debt markets are enormous. And um, you can see here that the yield, which is inverse to the price, jumps around quite a bit. And in general, it's been dropping pretty dramatically. And we saw this chart earlier, but you can see that U.S. government bonds have gone up quite a bit. Part of the reason is not just the U.S. dominance in, in the world, but also the uh, lack of inflation or deflation see a similar trend with the Japanese government bonds, or the so-called JGBs. When we look up JGBs, um, there's no good way to do this. There's a generic JGB. I thought there was. Look at this. Yeah, you can see the JGB yields are also similarly low, and this is just part of deflation. Does tech cause deflation? What is it monetary policy? Is it economic growth? What exactly is happening? We're not so sure. A lot of theories on it. I think it's more to do with technology personally than anything else. But um, you know, uh, that's the Japanese government bond long-term yield. So whether or not these things are good or bad is, is up to you. As a trader, you're just simply trying to take advantage of it. Now, these are the 10-year bonds. Now, I mentioned that there are two-year bonds and 10-year bonds and 30-year bonds. And the difference between these is called the yield curve. And you can actually look at these yield curves. You can do it by hand. You can do it with programs like this. And you can actually forget dollar swaps. Let's actually just look at government bonds. Let's pick the US and let's look at uh, treasuries. So here's the treasury curve, I-25. And let's actually look at it on a separate day. And look at that. A year ago, you can see that this in the white here, this is just really interesting, in the white, uh, you have uh, the year ago treasury curve, and in the in the orange, you have this year's treasury curve. And you can simply bet on whether or not this curve will flatten or steepen. And you can see that the flattener trade was better. The 10-year yield has dropped, and the two-year yield has gone up a little bit, and the one-year yield has gone up a little bit. You make you can make a billion-dollar bet, or a 10 billion-dollar bet, or a 50 billion-dollar bet on flattening and steepening. And your counterparty would be probably someone like Goldman Sachs, uh, who would set the trade up for you. But if you steepened uh, and you had a flattener on, you would lose money. And if you flattened while you had your flattener on, uh, you would uh, make money. And this is so-called tens versus twos, uh, where you can and you can make it by the way any number you want. Goldman Sachs is happy to structure your trade and make a commission, or you can use Morgan Stanley or UBS or anyone you want. But the whole idea is that people trade these uh, curves based on uh, things like inflation and so forth. Uh, bonds in the short end of the curve, you can imagine, have no default risk, 
Whereas bonds at the end of the curve say 30 years, well, gee, I don't know if Hillary Clinton becomes president and then, I don't know, Bernie Sanders becomes president after and he's 95 years old and he makes us a socialist country. Well, those 30 year bonds could be pretty risky. Whereas even if Hillary Clinton becomes president one year from now, I don't know that, uh, or Donald Trump for that matter, one year from now, I don't know that you could do enough damage to the country. So those are really just basically a proxy for inflation. Whereas the 30 year bonds become more of a proxy for, for default risk. So how those things move, um, again, you can see that they've, they've flattened quite a bit. Um, that means that the yield's gone down, so the price has gone up. If I were a trader today, I would put on uh, a steepener trade, where I think the, the government disarray, you can see by our presidential candidates and our budget and things like that, the inflation's not gonna change in the near term, but in the long run, I would imagine bonds would blow out. Now, a lot of people have lost a lot of money doing this trade. In fact, let's take a look at five years ago. Let's take a look at five years ago. see what that looks like. Yeah, there you go. It's even more steep. So it's all it's done is flatten, flatten, flatten to the point where we're at this orange line and it's really flat. I mean, it, it should cost you much more to borrow money 30 year obligation versus a five year obligation. But that difference, that spread has flattened, flattened, flattened. And uh, the reason is uh, paradoxically, I mean, we're assuming that there is no default risk in the US. And I think that that um, will change. And again, there's a lot more to this. I'm not an expert in this stuff, I'm not pretending I am, but I'm just merely kind of showing you what a macro hedge fund does. Now there's things like LIBOR and swaps that trade on LIBOR, um, you know, floating rate versus fixed rate swaps. I actually pasted this thing from ICAP, which you can actually look at, and then also this academic study. And again, if you're having trouble finding this, there's a link in the description box and I'll, I'll post it again. So there's all kinds of, of things you could do with respect to the yield curve or you can make direct interest rate bets. Uh, again, the LIBOR and the Euro dollar are, are floating in fixed rates that you can trade around. Uh, there's options on these swaps. These are all generally called swaps. And uh, the, the debt markets are fascinating. The other part of the debt markets include things like CDS. You probably know CDS as debt insurance. So let's pick uh, US government CDS to look at. Um, well, the US CDS is very, very low priced. It costs 26 basis points to protect an entire portfolio of US government bonds. There's almost no risk of default. Now, if the presidential election goes in Trump's favor, I bet these will bounce up quite a bit. Uh, but if you take a look at Brazilian CDS, Brazil isn't a country that's in terrible straits right now. They keep firing uh, their president and so forth. And for a while, there was some fear that Brazil could go bankrupt. And you can see that the CDS jumped up to 500 points. Uh, now it's down to 256, but that's sort of like a 2% chance of default, which is really kind of interesting. Now, if you look at uh, Greece CDS, they basically already defaulted, right? But it's 10, 10 percentage points. So you, can, you have to give up 10% to uh, ensure your, your uh, bonds there. Now, there's also CDS on companies. So you can look at like, Amgen CDS. Amgen is uh, very unlikely to default. You can see it's actually less likely to default than a company, mind you. And a company can do anything wrong. Uh, in fact, default just means you miss one interest payment. One interest payment. Uh, Amgen could have a drug that kills somebody or something like that. They could raise prices like buffoons. Uh, who knows what they might do? Uh, but uh, regardless, the, the cost of insuring Amgen bonds is extremely low. And you can have some fun with this if you actually look at the yield on Amgen bonds. There's no free lunch. So take a look at Amgen bonds. Let's pick, I don't know, some bonds like here. Let's see what they're yielding. And you can see that they're yielding 2%. So if you insured these bonds, they'd be yielding 1.5%. And, and you see they're 70 bips above treasuries. So maybe you can have, in a perfect world, 20 basis points of so-called free money. The problem is they're not that liquid, and as you tried to put these trades on, you would, your, your arbitrage would vanish. But there are sometimes, in real big panics, you can actually lock in some of these arbitrages, believe it or not. Um, CDS are notoriously not transparent. Um, so uh, those are CDS rates. All right, so there's all kinds of alphabet soup here, like CDO, CLO, which are collateralized debt and loan obligations. There's mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities. There's catastrophe bonds. 
There's all kinds of cool stuff that you can trade as a macro trader in practice. And there's exotic trades that I haven't even talked about, like weather and, and other really crazy stuff. You can make custom rates, like instead of LIBOR, you can have all these nutty kind of um, interest rates. Um, there's volatility, what we haven't discussed, trading volatility, which is its own kind of nightmare. Um, and you can basically trade anything you want. Uh, if you find a counterparty, there's total return swaps, there's uh, that are equity based, there's all kinds of swaps. So in any event, um, you know, the instruments that you can trade are up to your imagination. In practice, most people are just trading futures and currencies uh, and some yield curve stuff. But uh, in principle, you could trade virtually whatever you want. And again, I think that if you're trading equities, if that's your poison, so to speak, picking your poison of what you're going to trade, and you've never heard of any of these things, well, how do you know that the largest arbitrage opportunities are in um, equities and not in um, you know something else and like the Kazakhstan Tenge or whatever it might be and I think that's the sort of fallacy that we all have this sort of um, uh, universe fallacy where we think that all the arbitrage is in whatever we happen to be looking at at the time which is obviously ridiculous when there are an infinite number of different kind of um, uh, instruments to trade so how do we trade these instruments I'm going to be brief here and then we're going to go to questions and answers but inflation is, is one of the biggest things we're going to be looking at um, in trading macro instruments. All of these things, some of them are literally directly instruments that trade off of inflation, uh, like tips for instance, but some of these are a little less um, clear, like, like currencies are obviously very tied to inflation, but they're tied to other things too, uh, and certainly fixed income and, and uh, any fixed income um, is going to be tied to it. But things like you know commodities, maybe they're not as, as clearly tied to inflation. So what, what the heck is inflation? Well. Obviously, inflation is sort of the, the change of prices of, of various baskets of goods, and we have things like PCE and CPI and PPI that the government gives out that I don't think they're terribly useful um, to us. Uh, we can obviously look at sovereign bond prices uh, of, of countries with no default risk, like the US, um, and we can think about those tips as, as what inflation should be. Um, but uh, again, you know, what, 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 is it, what good is it to uh, someone thinking about inflation of something like a, a milk, a um, carton of milk or whatever, a rent, uh, those are important maybe, but if you're, um, I don't know, if you're a big investor that doesn't care about those things, you really care about your um, true uh, purchasing power, in other words, your alternative rate of return in investments, well, that's a, a more interesting concept. Maybe PCE and CPI actually don't matter uh, at all. Um, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's completely irrelevant. Maybe it's not, you know, you have to think about that. But in general, inflation is a really important concept, even for equity investors, because it it's ties discount rates to a reality. The reality is that over time, your purchasing power should drop, hypothetically at least. Um, again, whether that's practically true is, is a totally different question. You know, you buying a, uh, you know, it depends on what's inflating and at what rate, right? Buying a carton of milk, uh, and we can see now that food markets are very different from what we thought they might be and that they permanently inflate. Without government subsidies, it looks like food markets are actually dropping, uh, which is remarkable. The price of a carton of eggs has dropped dramatically over the years. Um, uh, look at uh, even something as silly, I hate to say it, as something like a illegal drug. The prices of, of marijuana and cocaine have dropped dramatically. So where is their inflation? Um, I just showed you that equity prices, which is, you know, you might not think of it as inflation, but one of my mentors, uh, a guy named Ed, actually sort of, who's very, very good at hypothesizing things, um, maybe not as good at, as actually executing on them, but he said, well, equities and bonds are the biggest goods there are, and they have their own inflation, right? So we have to think about these things really carefully, and they're very, very psychological, um, and you just have to sort of think about them. No, the price of wheat has dropped about 95% over the last several decades. It's really remarkable. Um, but again, I leave it to you to do that research. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't do that research. So yeah, asset classes and their long-term prices, you can sort of go study that, look at it for gold, for instance. Um, but you know, things like water, uh, water prices have gone up. So different markets uh, have different pricing and it's hard to look at basket prices and really think of them as relevant. All right, so what about things like GDP? Well, um, these are important. You can argue that GDP is a measure of inflation, <laughs> um, depending on how you look at it. Um, you could be really scientific and argue that the transactions uh, in a closed system should, the number of transactions shouldn't change um, 
uh, but again, we're getting very technical and hypothetical here. You can measure GDP, you can try to measure it at least. The calculus of how we do that is imperfect to say the least, and it's a very short-term transactional concept. So you can actually have the complete destruction of economy while GDP rises. Uh, and if you're a, a maybe a Luddite, you could argue that um, technology will, will change uh, the way we think about measuring things like GDP. So again, you can take the basic measurements of GDP and, and feel um, reasonable about them, but I don't, uh, I personally don't. Again, a per capita adjustment is extremely important. Um, different revisions are extremely important. Uh, and there's other economic data that we gotta, we gotta look at. Um, so um, take a look at uh, housing starts, Michigan Survey, Philly Fed, ISM, durable goods, all these things are important. Employment is one of the best ways to measure economic activity. And again, all things like currencies and, and debt and things like that will change based on employment. Um, if there's a little bit of lag, uh, I wouldn't worry about it. I'll be uploading this later with no lag. All right, so employment is a good indicator of economic health. It's a labor market, but again, there's changes to that given technology. So none of this is monolithic. We have to be intelligent when we think about them. It's the same way we have to be intelligent when someone tells us stocks go, bro go up in the long run. Well, I'm not gonna take your word for it, Mr. Bogle. Uh, uh, Vanguard, uh, uh, for instance, believes this. Um, instead, I'm gonna do my own homework. And, and the same thing applies in employment. Um, we have to think about, well, is, is a huge unemployment in the face of increasing efficiency coming from technology, what does that trade-off look like? And um, we have to think about that really carefully, and I suggest reading the primary research from uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics and things like that. Credit, um, uh, I'm not gonna go through this in great detail, but Federal Reserve um, controls the money supply, uh, but that's sort of uh, the main bank, there are shadow banks and things like that that uh, um, kind of uh, play a part of this. Uh, money supply is controlled by all kinds of parties you wouldn't normally think of, but in general, the Federal Reserve tries to control money supply with things like QE, TARP, the federal funds rate, and so forth. You can think about money supply in many different ways. There are the M measurements and so forth. And then finally, you can just look at yields um, for a view of the health of credit markets. And sometimes yields are, are not exactly the same as credit activity, right? You can have high yields, but if there's no credit activity, it's so-called frozen credit markets. So we have to think carefully about that. All right, there's some macro hedge funds. Why would you invest? Uh, why would you be a macro hedge fund? Well, one big advantage is liquidity. Um, there's a, a lot of liquidity in these markets. You can trade a billion dollars or $10 billion of, of a currency and nobody will care. Uh, whereas if you try to trade a billion dollars of an equity, people will go crazy and then report about it. But if you buy a million dollars, a billion dollars of yen, um, no one will even blink an eyelid. Uh, there's a lot of people who are talented, so if you have a good natural gift for trading, this is a great place to embody that gift. Most people don't have that natural gift, but if you do, there, there are some people who are truly talented, like Soros or so forth, Druckenmiller, that are just get it, and they somehow have unlocked in their mind all of these relationships. But in general, I, I tend to not believe um, uh, that those people are, are exist in, in, at least in more than just a handful of them. The disadvantages are that everyone has the same ideas in these markets. Everyone's in the same trade, so to speak, because there's only so many instruments to trade. Um, so who are some of these hedge funds? Bridgewater, Soros, Moore, Caxton, Tudor, etc. cetera. Um, some of these people are so good at it that it gets beyond a um, educated guess. There's p-values that suggest that it's impossible to have the trading record of some of these traders. Now, having said that, um, arguably with enough attempts, you would have someone who's an outlier, but in general, uh, um, that's not uh, possible. There are individuals, by the way, some, some people like Joe Lewis, who I encourage you to look up if you're interested. Um, so sometimes you make so much money that it can just be your own money, so to speak. But those are, um, that's sort of my uh, uh, spiel on macro. That was about 70 minutes. I hope it was helpful. Again, the goal is not to, I'm, not, I'm probably not gonna go back to these topics frequently. The goal is to get back in the swing of doing these lessons. Um, I added Principles as an autobiography. Uh, I added Trading to Win, which is a, a book we haven't discussed. It's about psychology and trading, which is very important, by uh, Kiev, who is one of the greatest writers. Uh, he's passed away, but one of the greatest writers ever on this subject. So anyway, uh, I hope some of this was useful. Again, we didn't get into the nitty gritty and application of investing, which I've done in many, many videos with respect to equities. A lot of this is more about opening your mind up to different ideas. Um, and just knowing that these things exist can sometimes be really helpful. So I'm happy to take questions. Um, you can call me on my cell phone. Uh, I think Drake, to, to bite off Drake for a second, on 
217, 273. Um, I prefer if you keep the questions to, to, um, to uh, this subject, but if you uh, have to ask me about something else, I'm happy to answer it. Please don't call over and over and over and over again. I think that's kind of disrespectful. Um, try not to do that. Um, but uh, you're welcome to. Uh, you're welcome to do that. But try try not to call in over and over again. All right, six four six two one seven two seven eight three. Wonder if my phone is even working given that nobody's called. Here we go. Hello? Hey, um, what do you think of top down analysis? Well, that's what macro is, really. It's, uh, oh, hold on one second. I'm just setting up my periscope. Top down is, is the colloquial way of saying macro, right? Because you're ultimately thinking about um, bigger issues than individual situations of stock. Having said that, what you might be also discussing is the, the approach to investing in equities with top-down analysis. So the, the idea there is instead of analyzing, say, um, the balance sheet and income statement and conference calls of the, the gap in Walmart, you basically are just saying, look, I think e-tailing is going to put retailing out of business and I'm going to short all Best Buy, Walmart, Target, et cetera, and I'm not even going to look. I'm not even going to look at um, those companies individually. I'm just focused on a thematic so-called top-down hypothesis. And it's a very valid way to invest. I, I don't particularly like it myself, but it's perfectly reasonable. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Martin Screlly. Yeah, Mark. Hello? Hello? Yo, hello? Yeah. Yo, what's up, man? Hey, uh, so, so, uh, like, you plan on, um, like, making, uh, like, a new pill or anything or what? Listen to me, child. I am not the one. I am not the one to waste his time. You understand me? Man, you sound like a bitch. Do not waste, my, do not waste my time. I will find you. You want me to find you right Fuck now? Fuck you. you want That's me to, a simple question, asshole. You want me to find you right now? I will. Martin Screlly. What up, Sarko? Hello? What up, man? What you up to? Uh, I'm taking questions on investing. Do you have a question? You're taking questions on, on what? Investing, David. Investing. Oh, okay. Hey, you remember my name. Straight, straight. I, I'm looking up your name. What do you want? Wait, how do you know my name? Because uh, I, I use caller ID. Okay, well, it has my name in it? Yeah. Do you have a question about investing? No, man, I just want to call you. Let's Okay, I'm taking questions on investing. So maybe you should I maybe you should hang up. Well, actually, no, I do have questions. Martin Screlly. Hey, Connor, do you use the MACD? Do you use the regular parameters? No, I don't, I don't look at any tech, so-called technical analysis, stochastic uh, measurements. I think they're not useful. Uh, yep. What's your net worth to be spent right now? This kind of stuff. Do you trade every day? I don't trade every day. Um, I have a lot of companies and assets. I mean, it's mostly private companies, so it's hard to determine exactly what they're worth. Let me ask you this. Uh, when did you first start trading? Uh, I don't know. I was probably 15. <laughs> Sachs. They have a brokerage? Goldman Sachs is uh, maybe the world's biggest brokerage firm. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. You might have heard uh, might have heard of it. <clears throat> Martin Screlly. Hello? Yes. Martin Screlly.
Hello? Martin Screlly. Hey, Martin, I have a quick question. Yeah. What do you think of like, index funds like Vanguard versus, you know, stock picking? Well, I just spent a lot of time explaining that I don't think invest, I don't think stocks go up over the long run. Okay. Hope you were paying attention. Martin Scully. Hey, um, I'm just wondering, what is your uh, opinion on like genetic modification and like CRISPR and stuff? Are you like looking to get into that? Did you say CRISPR? Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't really know how to pronounce it to be honest with you. <laughs> well, I mean, is it valuable for me to tell you the answer if you don't understand the question? Well, I know what it is, but I've like read up on that. I don't know the pronunciation. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, you know, making a drug out of changing the genes in human cells has been a goal for a very, very long time. It's just not feasible, even with CRISPR, in my opinion. But, you know, it's a very technical discussion. But do you think it will be to the point where there's actually going to be designer babies and stuff? Maybe. I don't know. You know, uh, we'll see. It's too early to tell. <laughs> I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think it's likely just because of the way CRISPR works on a technical basis. But never say never. Cool. Well, thank you. Sure. I'll take some questions on. Um, on. Um, I'll put the phone closer to the microphone. But I'll take any questions on. Um, online here. How did you get into investing to begin with? What's the first few things you would do? Well, I discuss a lot of that in some of these lessons, so you should just watch that and you'll, you'll sort of... Uh... You might benefit from that. Best food near Rick? I wouldn't know. Easiest way to get a Bloomberg is to pay for it. Um, well, sometimes I say you're a trader, sometimes I'm an investor. Like, those words don't mean anything. Anytime you trade cash for some security, you're trading and investing. I mean, investing is just maybe like a arrogant way to say you're trading. Uh, Bristol Meyer stocks, complicated. I haven't looked at it in a while. Optivo doesn't work for one cancer, but it works for a lot of other cancers. Are currencies usually more risky than equity investments? Well, like, currencies don't move a lot by definition. Um, equities can go worthless, so can currencies, I suppose. I don't know that it's easy to, easy to answer. Do you consider macro factors when deciding an equity entry point? No, I don't. Um, Warren Buffett um, sort of says the same thing. Although, to practice what one preaches, I think one often likes to make long-term investments when the markets have been sort of uh, in, in dire straits. Favorite economist. I, uh, that's like asking what my favorite uh, um, dental uh, drill procedure is. I don't know, root canal or, uh, or, uh, or uh, extraction. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like economists. Maybe Adam Smith. I don't know. I didn't say that real estate and land ownership is bad. Um, I just don't understand it, and I don't know that I I ever will. Um, I understand that there's finite property in places that people want to live, and they're willing to ascribe value to those places. I just I'm not comfortable with analyzing the supply and demand of them. Hello. Hi, is this Martin Shirley? Yes. Okay. Uh, so you're still doing a. Uh answers on investing and all that stuff, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, I'm in the long, I'm just a, just a kid at a high school in Southern California, and I was wondering if you've ever read The Intelligent Investor? Uh, come on. It's like... It's, so, yeah. Right. Yeah, yes, right. yeah, yeah. So, uh, a lot of people say that it's, you know, like the holy Bible of investing or whatever, but, you know, I was wondering if you had any, you know, criticisms of it. Sure, yeah, I mean, it's a book, you know, it's written by a guy who never made any money investing. I, I, I mean, 
there's a hundred criticisms of it. I think the point of books isn't that they dictate to you what to do. It's the point of these books is to open your mind to ideas and you're supposed to think through yourself kind of the pros and cons. Obviously the very mechanical way of value investing uh, doesn't work in practice. Um, you know, one of the things a lot of people try to do, for instance, is if a company has, say, $2 a share of cash on its balance sheet and it's trading for a dollar, a lot of people will try to buy that stock and then shut down the company and get the cash back. But the reality okay. is that the amount of time and cost it takes to do that, you'll burn that whole dollar, sometimes even more. Um, okay. And there's so, I don't know, you know, I think that it's just, it's just something that should expand your mind, but it's not like a prescription for success or anything like that. that Hello? Dollars, you might make more. Uh, if you call in, make sure you put the speakers on mute or you're wearing headphones or something. I don't want to hear me hearing me. Do you think Peter Lynch or Bill Ackman is a legend in investment? No, neither are legends in anything. Maybe legends of bullshitting, but hello. Yeah, please, please put yourself on mute. Hello. Mr. Sperling, thank you for your time. My name is Tim. Hello. I have a question on BRX stock. Any okay. thoughts? I don't have any thoughts on it. I don't, you know, like I. Uh, Valiant Pharmaceuticals. Do you know anything about it? Yeah, I know a little bit about Valiant. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I just think it's, you know, it's it's a public company. You know, it's not that exciting either way. I think, you know, it's probably fair. If you, if you had to choose one stock to invest in, what would it be? I, it's probably a private company. Private company? Yeah. Public companies are very well scrutinized by investors, and it's very hard to find good public companies to trade. I mean, I have a few public companies in my portfolios. I just... You know, I'm not here to give stock tips to anyone. Uh, thank you for your time, sir. Sure. Hello? Hey, Martin. Yes? Hey, how you doing, guys? Uh, I wanted to ask you, have you ever read uh, The Art of the Deal? No. <laughs> All right, man, thanks. Thanks. Can I elaborate on the comments? Yeah, I mean, Lynch, I don't I mean... It was one of the first books I read, his kind of bullshit beating the market or whatever it was called. Um, the Magellan Fund, uh, it was just a growth fund. I mean, it, it did well in the time when the markets, it was hard not to do well. Um, I'm just not, you know, it's, you don't reward someone for doing well when it's easy to do well. Ackman has like lost a lot of money since the inception of Pershing Square, so. He's more of a salesperson than an investor. Yeah, one up on Wall Street. It is a rice cake. Best place to put undeployed capital? Cash. <laughs> Municipal bonds are just um, bonds issued by municipalities like states. And they fund the... Uh, basically, they fund the... Uh, expansion of some public works and there's kind of this interesting arbitrage in <laughs> municipal bonds that the federal government will never let a municipality go bankrupt and so municipal bonds are like implicit guarantees by the federal government so you'll often have these pretty good deals in municipal bonds but you know it's never say never right in a really bad economic environment a state can go bankrupt while the government does not Alex uh, asks, why invest in cash if interest rates are so low? Again, there's no free lunch. I, I, sometimes I wonder if people are even listening to me. If, if interest rates are really high, it means that inflation's high. It's not like you're getting a good deal. <laughs> I mean, you can, you know, what, what good is it to, to, to get that 5% when your money's dropping by 5%? It doesn't mean, mean a difference. Hello? Hey, Martin. I wanted to know if you had any thoughts on Novavax, particularly their RXD vaccine. Novavax? 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not Jim Cramer. You know, I'm not taking individual questions on uh, individual stocks. I mean, if I look, I, the way you're supposed to look at a stock is you're supposed to spend 100 hours carefully looking at it, researching it, you know, getting every nook and cranny. You can't just make a split second split second judgment on a stock and you know I haven't I haven't spent a hundred hours on it I'm focused on my okay, I can't I can't listen to the feedback so I hung up um, uh, you know I'm spending my time creating new companies instead of looking at um, individual stocks at the moment what do I do if I'm just an average person who wants their savings to have a good chance of beating inflation Honestly, I think you're shit out of luck. I think you should spend your time making as much money as possible in your career. It doesn't mean you have to be a workaholic, but you should focus on getting skills that will help you earn more money. I don't think you should, like I've said a million times, I think investing, this, this idea that you're gonna beat um, all the great professional investors who bar are barely making any money themselves, that you are gonna single-handedly somehow invest in some stocks that are gonna make you a fortune. It's as likely as me going into the ring against Brock Lesnar and knocking him out. I mean, why would you want to fight Brock Lesnar? Why? For money. Yeah, you bet Brock Lesnar your life savings that you're gonna beat him up. That's what it's like, you investing in the stock market. It's stupid. Um, unless you're willing to dedicate all of your time to this, don't do it. There's people who are, and they get paid a lot, and they're gonna take your money. That's basically how it works. Um, a, I do think it's a zero-sum game. I mean, again, look at the figures I, I started with in this um, in this uh, lesson. Net of inflation and net of taxes, stocks don't really have a positive expected return. Focus on yourself. Make an expected return out of your income, out of your, your own self. I think that's sort of what you should be doing. Hello? Hi, uh, is this Martin? You have, you have to turn off your stream and noise in the background. I, I'm not going to take your call if you have that. Um, so yeah, I think that if you're willing to put in an enormous amount of time to study investing and so forth. Um, so BP pays us, let me see here on BP. BP pays a 7% a seven, a seven yield. Well, you're taking risk. You know, of course, you can look up high high yield bonds all you want. You're taking an enormous amount of risk, paying a seven percent yield because there's a chance they're not going to keep paying it, and you're going to lose equity value. That's that's the problem. It doesn't it doesn't mean there's not return out there. There's return for risk unit. You call me, idiot. Yeah, yeah, I have a call. risky bonds or least risky instrument you can have I mean you're not they're probably the best I mean they're probably the best uh, investment you can make in terms of uh, safety and, and return I mean you, you're gonna get something um, but again there's no free lunch I mean you're making an implicit bet when you buy Treasury bonds you're making a bet that um, inflation will drop you're making a bet that the United States will remain the most powerful country and you can lose an enormous amount relative to uh, to that, but in terms of, of loss of principal, there's n there's virtually no risk. But in terms of an investment, I'm not sure it's a good investment. Yeah, 
Is Trashy still scared of the dog? Yes, she is. Trashy. She's very scared. Yeah, I like uh, the, all the stocks I looked at in tech. I, I like stamps.com. I liked RealPage. So, you yeah, know, there's some stocks that I bought. RealPage has done pretty well. I like that one a lot. It's a real estate software thing. We're going to look at some software companies. We were looking at Groupon last. Groupon had this enormous move. I wasn't sure if I trusted it too much. And then we're going to look at um, other kind of Yelps and economy sharing companies like, um, not, econ uh, not sharing companies necessarily, but yeah, companies like Yelp and um, uh, Angie's List. Why don't I like Malcolm Gladwell? Um, I think Malcolm Gladwell is like the scient scientist's equivalent of Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, it's just a pop writer that, you know, doesn't, isn't that insightful. I'm not saying he doesn't research his books. He does. It's just the insights and, and conclusions he draws are extremely boring. <laughs> If you're fascinated by Malcolm Gladwell, I feel, I feel bad for you. A, a din me full ship. Yes, I, I can full some ship. <laughs> this is Albanian language. I just, I, I, I don't like his, uh, pers I don't, I don't like his, um, basically I'm a hater. I don't like the amount of books he sells relative to what he's putting out. Um, Chris Jericho is a hero of mine. By equivalent, I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson isn't an important scientist. He just sort of frames things in a way that people tend to like, um, which I'm not saying is not a skill, but the idea that, you know, you can gain some wisdom from Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson as opposed to actually just reading Newton and Galileo and Darwin yourself, um, you're better off doing that than getting it filtered by Neil deGrasse Tyson. Arcanes or Hayek, I don't know. Yeah, I'll do the reading list at some point. I'm so busy that, you know, it's hard for me to sit there and do all of it. it these are just sal salted rice cakes. Um, internship. Uh, I don't think in interning at a young age is like there's this fallacy that you need to do everything first. You need to do everything before everyone else. It, it doesn't make any sense. You know, uh, you should always be wanting to educate, your, educate yourself. But just because I did something when I was 17 or 18 instead of, you know, 22 or 25, I, don't let that fool you into thinking that that's how you can generate superlative results. It might actually even hurt you. I did not look at dividends with respect to uh, the S&P, but I don't, I mean, given that most of my point is about selection bias of looking at a singular country. I don't think it really makes a difference. How could it hurt you? I, I mean, you can you can be sort of chasing the wrong ideals by being thrust into a situation when you're too young to understand it. You don't have the perspective. Chomsky's great. Yeah, I know Flanagan's looked at this a little bit. I was not a chemistry major. <laughs> I hope that shows. I'm going to try to finish this chemistry uh, introduction, but my tax rate's very high. <laughs> Do I play instruments? Yeah, I, I play them sometimes. Yankees or Mets? I'm actually anti-baseball, so... Yeah, don't, don't, you know, if you're not willing to become a professional investor, I don't think you should invest. It's, it's just the same thing as, like, I want to be a casual MMA fighter. Well, you're either going to do it or you're not, and especially, you know, you might want to be a casual basketball player or guitar player, but if someone said, I want you to play that guitar and try to beat the Radiohead guitarist for money, I'd say, no thanks, I don't want to play this game, what the fuck? You know, and that's sort of, um, that's sort of the nature of, of investing. I mean, do, do I like playing guitar? Of course I like playing guitar. Do I like playing guitar for money against the Radiohead guitarist? No, I'm not, good. I'm not interested in that. 
you know, do what you're what you're really good at for money. Um, why would you do something you want to like kind of partially do for money? That's what people do for investing, and it doesn't make any sense. When my tech company is uh, released, it'll be major news. You'll you'll see it. It'll probably be by the end of the year. I should go back to working on that, but um, I've been uh, working on my tech software company. It'll it'll be there soon. Nothing wrong with the CFA, you know. I'm just good to be able to pass a test like that. I don't think it's like that important. My cat is scared and asleep, and she still thinks the dog is here somewhere. So I think she's tired because she like stays vigilant for the dog. So she's like. Um, nervous that the dog might be here. So she might know the dog's not here and she's catching up on sleep now because <laughs> it's safe. Um, hi Martin, could you talk about the first time you made a big profit and how happy you were to tell friends and family? You know, I, I mean, you can take a look at my life. Like I, profit doesn't change how happy or sad I am. Um, you know, uh, I've got, let's see, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Nine, 19 programming textbooks within reach of, of my two arms. I'll be happy when I've mastered those. Things that make me happy in life are friends, relationships, family, uh, the pursuit of um, knowledge, good food. You know, it's as simple as anyone else. Uh, I'm not, you know, sure, professional achievement, absolutely. It, it's, it's something to be happy about. But if you let that control you, if cash rules everything around me, then I think that, you know, that would be a, a negative outcome. If you keep asking me for a job on this format, I'm just going to block you. I don't care if you're 19 and homeless. You know, tough luck. I have a lot of books, but I don't, I don't think it's the number of books. It's the amount of time you spend reading them. Things like that. Think the dollar could clap? Sure. Favorite Touche More album has to be uh, uh, Parting the Sea Between Brightness and Me. I think that's what it's called. Great, great album. Uh, efficient market hypothesis. I, I actually think it's fine. I mean, I, the idea, it's again, it's not it's supposed to be monolithic. The idea that markets are efficient should be something that permeates your brain at some point. It's important. I mean, 99% of the time we spend investing, we're wasting our time. We're recycling garbage, uh, stuff that's already done by other people. It's not fruitful. Um, it's that 1% after the enormous amount of energy and time and insight that you find that one great investment, that's, yes, it is valuable. Uh, but in general, yeah, of course markets are efficient. That's the point of a market. How many fiends do I have? Or how many friends do I have? Because I can answer both. Would you say you're good at investing? Um, am I deaf in the Discord? I am, hang on. Um, so I'd say that if I focused 100% on investing, um, that I'm relatively good at it. The problem is it depends on the format because I think private equity and entrepreneurship is a form of investing. So let's leave it at that. But yeah, do I ever leave the US? Rarely and right now I'm not allowed to. What if you only focus 95% of your time there? Uh, I think it's sort of like um, Carl Malone once said, you know, he every time he wasn't in the gym, it made him nervous because there's somebody else in the gym. I think to be really good at something, you do have to dedicate yourself to it. It doesn't mean you have to be pathological about it, but I do think you, you have to, you can't, 95 sounds good, but once you start like slipping into the 80% range, you know, you're gonna be beaten by someone who's doing it 100%. The best chess book is called uh, My System by uh, Aaron Nimzovich. I would suggest you start with that. I have a $5 million bill, but I still can't leave um, the country without permission. 
can't even leave New York City without permission. Uh, my companies are not looking at autism. We were a while back, but it's a pretty difficult, pretty difficult place to invest. If you go anywhere country-wise, where would you go? I, I, I want to see every country. I'm like everyone else. I don't think a Roth IRA is a tool for unsophisticated investor. Again, just replace it with a boxing analogy. Do you think I should box and not know, well, because I, do you think I should bet money on my own boxing match against a professional boxer and I don't know how to box? The question answers itself. What do I think about antidepressants? Well, uh, the Paxils and the Lexapros of the world are very modest efficacy wise. They're very good safety wise. The newer antidepressants, uh, specifically ketamine, could revolutionize treatment of depression. Favorite Blink-182 spinoff group? Uh, none of the above. Do I take illicit drugs? Now, I've never taken an illegal drug in my life, including mar marijuana cigarettes or um, cocaine or never had an interest in any of it. Some of it comes from some fear that, you know, I'm, it's going to alter me permanently, but uh, I know that fear is ridiculous now as a, an older experienced pharmacologist. Uh, benzos, like Xanax, I mean, they're great for short-term alleviation of anxiety. I, I don't take them. Uh, when I was diagnosed with anxiety uh, about 15 years ago, I did get a prescription for Clonopin, but, you know, I, thank God, you know, I don't, I don't take them. I know people who do have to take benzos every day. Are you only learning JavaScript? Yeah, mostly JavaScript. Um, it is the language of the internet. Um, it's hard to build a website without it. Um, so I've learned JavaScript and React, uh, which is sort of a library for JavaScript, jQuery. Um, the rest of the stack kind of scares me, like Node.js, and you know, I obviously have to learn a little bit about databases as a result, but I'm getting there. I take Claritin. Cleared and clear. Managerial challenges, I mean, no one should ever uh, be a CEO. It's, it's difficult. Um, people are the hardest part. I mean, people are crazy. <laughs> Managing people is unbelievably difficult. Um, but, um, you yeah, know, so I would say that is a challenge. I don't use R or SAS in investing. Uh, quantitative hedge funds do. Yeah, my, my pharmaceutical knowledge is uh, self-taught. I don't think you should recreationally take any kind of medicine. I don't know Python. Uh, I'm sure I'll learn it at some point. The uh, new venture is 100% technology. No. Hey, kitty. No. Uh, no pharmaceuticals involved. Is college a scam, more or less? Doggy's gone, kitty. Doggy's gone. All right, 12 minutes to go. What are you most grateful for right now? My health. Um, health is something we take for granted. I think we expect it to be free sometimes, which is also frustrating. I think I understand the healthcare system better than most. And this idea that, um, you know, uh, we should all have drugs for free and, you know, um, so forth. I think we, we take our, our health for advantage. And I'm very, very grateful and thankful for my good health. Relatively good health. <laughs> not, not in perfect health, but, you know, relatively good health. You know, I'm alive, <laughs> principally. But uh, I know people who are who died 15, 20 years before my age, which is 33. And, you know, the fact that I'm alive and I'm likely to live much longer is fantastic. I, I don't know what to thank or who to thank every day for being healthy, but thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, sort of a, it's sort of an enterprise technology product and it sort of faces the consumer a little bit as well. So we'll see. Biggest regret, uh, <laughs> how much time do you have? Um, do, do you want a list of people? Do you want a list of things? Um, I don't know, uh, 
I don't regret. You know, I just move forward. Yeah, I think AI is going to come and, and be, be here. Would you move to Silicon Valley? I don't think you need to be anywhere to, you know, look at Buffett runs the world's biggest investment company out of Omaha, Nebraska. Um, how do I stay so positive on a day that there's nothing to be negative about? Uh, to ties into Mustafa's question, are you happy? Um, yeah, very happy. It's a great time to be alive, great country to be alive in. I'm just the luckiest guy in the world. What is your exercise regime? Eat lots of fatty food, drink lots of beer, go on Pokemon walks, that's about it. I'd rather have a bad diet, be happy, and die five years before I should than uh, the alternative. Do I like Oprah? I mean, I, I, like, I, like, uh, I like her success. Average net exposures at your fund. Uh, I don't have a fund. <laughs> Is there enough talent in New York to run your tech company? God, I hope so. The biggest problem with tech companies is just getting them off the ground. Not, you know, you're worried about talent pool. That's a totally different, you know, ball game. Am I spiritual or, or religious? Not, no. What is the meaning of life? Unfortunately, I, I don't think there is one, um, and I certainly am not the person who could answer. Have you ever made a bad bet? Yes. <laughs> This week, today, this month, this year. I, I do pay people to write code for our company. I'm I think when you run a company you should know what your employees are doing um, and help them. Uh, uh, the code base is now sufficiently more advanced that I can really reasonably contribute to. So, um, you know, I think that uh, it's a hobby, one, I love it, and then two, uh, how many women have you been with? What were you thinking while being handcuffed and photographed? It was basically like, this is a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> That's basically going through my head over and over again. <laughs> this some bullshit. I didn't notice there's so many questions on Periscope. You saw the Wu-Tang album, yes. How many women have I been with? Let me try and calculate that. This would probably be like sub 100. Close to 100, something like that. Were you bullied when you were young? No. I'm not the kind of person that takes bullying. Gaudi owned me. Huh. That's not the way I perceived it. How much money did my dad give me? Negative dollars. Negative money. <laughs> Would I guest star in a Dungeons & Dragons game? Of course. <laughs> of course. Best SNES game, Madden 95. How many of the women of the 100 women would be with you if you were broke. Uh, so before, I would have said about 20, 30 of them were pre-success. Pre <laughs> I don't think about it, I just let it happen. Volleyball or soccer girls? Volleyball.
How about 100 plus 1? How much time do you spend studying daily? All of it. You jinx that soccer, then soccer. Have you had sex? No. Celibate. Virginal. Albanian girls. I don't know where they are. <laughs> Black guys or white guys? Uh, we playing sports? Hours of sleep, too many, like seven or eight hours a day. Maybe more, nine. I like to sleep. I don't know. Favorite type of ethnic food? I don't like ethnic food. I like American food. I like hot dogs. I, I chickened out of the game, basketball game, because I hate Huffington Post. Beer or wine? Both, please. Oh man, video game console? I was a video game freak as a kid. I love video games. How do you bend your leg like that? Um, I am a little flexible. I don't know. Do I have a schedule? Not really. I have a lot of stuff to do tomorrow. Uh, I work really hard. I'm not a natural genius. I'm a natural idiot. Ever read the Bible? Sure have. Great book. Let's see this Canadian keeps calling me. Hello, Canadian. Yo, what's good? Subhuman Canadian, how can I help you? You can help me by letting me know, like, when you've shorted, like, Lehman Brothers for two bill or two million or whatever, and they tell you, yo, pay up, and you're like, no, fuck you, you're going under, how do you pull it off? Well, it was a lawsuit. It was really complicated. Um... But yeah, basically, I ended up paying them myself many, 10 years later, basically. It was crazy. Okay, last well, question. How do you um, suss out fake ass biotechs and pharma companies? Just, and have, a, money just have a lot of uh, experience doing it, basically. No, but like, like. Hello? Hello? Yes? Um, can I invest some of your money? No. I don't want to invest my own money. Okay. My uh, trial is next year, next uh, July, June or July. I'm not worried about it. Will you go to trial? Of course. What happens if I get convicted? Well, it's up to the judge. <laughs> uh, jail time is definitely a possibility. Shadow brokers. Yeah, man, I, if I gotta do a bit, I gotta do a bit. What's up? Case is very strong. I think we're gonna win. What would be your approach to prison? Um, from what I told is it's extremely boring white collar experience. Jail is a possibility how many years? I, I don't think very much if you do the mathematics behind it. Might be like a Brock Turner type sentence. Sorry, I. That was a bad joke. Of course I'm still I'm still gonna release music if I go to if I get locked up. Alright, so that's about it for today. I really, really appreciate you guys. Um um, coming to view this, it uh, means a lot to me that you guys care.
care about um, what I'm doing and thinking about. Um, I hope you learned a little something about investing. Um, I'll plan to do this tentatively next Sunday afternoon, not a week from today, six days from today. And I'll try to, I don't know, get back to, um, uh, I'll try to think of something interesting for you guys. Um, I don't want to be monotonous, monotonous or repetitive. But no, it means a lot to me uh, that you guys uh, care and want to listen and you know respect and support me. It, you know, I can't tell you how um, how great it feels. Um, you know, there's someone who just committed suicide uh, after being arrested um, a few months ago, and I have this amazing outpouring of support and love just walking down the street. Seven since my girlfriend moved in. Um, we've been keeping track of how many people stop me in the street and so far it's seven in a row and all of them are like very positive and supportive and um, nobody said, you know, I don't like you or whatever. Uh, I don't expect that to continue forever, but um, thanks so much. It means a lot to me and the least I can do is share a little bit of the knowledge I've gained on this crazy journey and uh, stay tuned. There's, there's more to come. So thanks again, everyone. Talk to you soon. Hey, you got the pickup? 200, 200, 200 keys. Don't fucking shortchange me this time. Don't fucking shortchange me, Pablo. You know what happened to the last guy? Hey, Mark. My name is XYZ. I'm here to talk to you about ABC. Not, uh, not, um, hey, Martin. You know, I'm your best friend, hey, Martin. <laughs> Give you respect. <laughs> nice copy boxes for stuff, huh? The fuck you talking about? You wanna get hacked on? You wanna go, bro? PHP script, you pay Bitcoin. <laughs> you pay. Why you pay Bitcoin? We hack equation group. Hey, Martin. Why I trust you? Is he there? Uh, if you have a question, just ask it, like, instead of being a bitch. No, I tried calling on a stream earlier. I just want to know, with someone who has less than five grand on cash on hand, should I do individual stocks or should I? I can I can answer that for you. I can answer that for you on his behalf. So stocks or mutual funds? Neither. Neither. Oh, what should I do as a You should. Uh, How do I erase this fucking thing? You should 